Well, hello. I don't think I have to introduce you, but uh, welcome, Evan. Thank you. Yeah, great to be here again. <laughs> so, um, what's your overall experience right now at the conference? Well, it feels super great to be able to connect with people again because, you know, my last conference was three years ago and I've basically been just coding at home alone or doing online conferences, which I am now getting tired of. And uh, so, yeah, it's super nice to be able to just come back and meet people in real life. Uh, actually also meeting a lot of new faces, uh, people who've joined the Vue ecosystem in the past three years, who I've actually never got to meet in person before. So now we actually got the whole V team here. So that's, yeah, super exciting. So I saw the entire list of uh, things that came out during uh, 2022, mm -hmm. 2022, I think. Mm -hmm. um, what would you consider the most uh, impressive, um, how, how do you say it, like thing that came out at the moment? Um, you mean inside the Vue and V ecosystem? Yeah, because uh, for example, Feed came out, right? Yeah. Like, uh, what's well, the biggest achievement in your yeah. opinion? I think 2022 is the year of like Vite's breakout year, pretty much. Uh, I think we released it in 2020, and in 2021, uh, it was kind of like getting slowly getting adoption and um, building a team. Uh, and I think 2022 is the year where uh, the team is really starting to uh, get, getting mature and pulling off great work and. Uh, so V essentially grew from something that's kind of new and experimental into something a lot of people consider production ready and willing to adopt in their production projects. So um, yeah, I think that's that's super great for to see V growing so rapidly, so successfully, and also like having a really great community. Uh, I think that's the, probably the thing that I'm most proud of. Yeah. So to me, as a as a developer, um, I'm into Next View, mm -hmm. uh, but I had a hard time grasping as an application developer feed mm -hmm. um, because where does it fit uh, mm -hmm. compared to Webpack and stuff? And yep. like you said, it it really uh, grew fast, right? Um, so how's this going with uh, potential sponsors? And is there like a lot of uh, attention that this could be a valuable mm -hmm. thing for sponsors and partner to, to partner up with Feed because mm -hmm. for few it was much more natural, right? Yeah. So how does yeah. that work? Um, so I think first of all we so we got uh, Stack Blitz which uh, is able to sponsor Matthias's work. So they actually hired Matthias to work on Veed full time. So in a way, like you can say Stack Blitz is in fact the biggest sponsor of, of Veed. Uh, I think that's great because um, you know, like for Vue, like you, it would take maybe four or five uh, Platinum sponsors to be able to cover the full-time salary of a developer, but Stackblitz actually just did that for Matthias. Uh, so I think that's great, right? So uh, then we get some other sponsors, but overall, um, I don't consider like getting sponsorship a primary concern for Vite as long as it's sustainable, right? Because we're not building it to like get VC or make money. It's really about can we just keep sustaining the, develop, uh, the development healthy in a healthy fashion? And can we maintain a good collaboration between all the people involved in the ecosystem? I think that's the primary focus. Uh, if we can get more sponsorship to make this process easier, great. But I think even as now, it's already working pretty well. So um, talking about uh, adoption of feed, right? You've mm -hmm. mentioned that other frameworks would uh, soon be able to yeah. also uh, leverage feed uh, to build their own uh, frameworks. Uh, I th think you mentioned uh, Astro, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also saw a Twitter message about uh, SolidJS with the signals. Mm -hmm. And it was about, well, signals are actually mm -hmm. uh, a thing that could be relatively easy done in Vue, for example. Yep. Um, you're known to be the kind of person that quickly adopts things <laughs> where you, if you think it's, it might yeah. be valuable for few, like the composition API, mm -hmm. I think it started off with the hooks thing. Mm -hmm. um, can you mention maybe one or two things that you might be considering from other frameworks that would be mm -hmm. really beneficial to few and or maybe few? Well, uh, so first of all, our exploration of reactivity transform obviously is influenced by Svelte, uh, which Unfortunately, we didn't end up adopting it. I think um, the good thing is we are always looking at the other options and thinking like how 
whether it makes sense for Vue and whether it's worth exploring. I think in the case of Reactivity Transform, we try to see whether the, uh, the IDX of Svelte would fit in a Vue context. And in the end, we felt, OK, maybe it's not the best fit. Um, and so, but that process was helpful because it helped us to better understand where the DX lies, how the frameworks actually differ, what are the trade-offs and different decisions are there. Um, and in the case for uh, Solid, so Vapor Mode is obviously influenced by Solid in a way because we are using a very similar compilation strategy. Um, and underneath, uh, Solid actually uses a very similar reactivity model with Vue, which is why we can easily replicate the Solid uh, signal-like API. But it's really more about showcasing the underlying similarity and how the different designs kind of emphasize different trade-offs. Um, so for some users, maybe the way solid signals work is a bit of a too restrictive or too verbose for them. Uh, they, they like the more uh, free or flexible nature of the Vue's API style. But for some users, maybe they work in a team environment where uh, code safety and code ownership is super important, then maybe for them, uh, using a more restrictive API could result in better code quality, right? So it's kind of a different trade-off uh, that it kind of depends on your team, but as a framework uh, for Vue, we are always willing to explore these different trade-offs and options, and we encourage our users to also uh, think in a more open-minded fashion because uh, sometimes when they see, say, uh, Solid API or React API, you have a natural reaction of, oh, it doesn't look like Vue. Or, but what I want to show is, understand, so if you look past the API surface and think about the underlying implementation, they are very similar and connected. Uh, so uh, it's more important to realize what are the reasons for these different API designs to emerge. Like, what are they prioritizing? Does it fit your specific case? You need to think through all of this to understand the decisions before uh, deciding whether it's for you or not, right? Not just to say, because it looks like another thing, I'm going to reject it outright. I don't think that's the right mindset. So I, I made the, the same mistake uh, yeah. until I watched the pod or uh, listened to a podcast of mm -hmm. the, the creator of uh, Solid. Mm -hmm. um, he was mentioning that the, the, vend the function itself doesn't re-render and acts more like uh, sort of like a setup function and yep. it immediately make me think about few. Mm -hmm. Would that be a good way to describe the similarities? Yeah, it's in fact um, the way that Solid's reactivity model and Vue's reactive model, like if you just look beyond the API surface, they work almost the same. So uh, in a way, a lot of React users say, oh, we find Solid so refreshing because it's not like hooks. It doesn't repeatedly run with all the stale closures and stuff. And in fact, that's the same experience they would get from Vue. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. So um, there are obviously a couple of trends that are not directly associated with, uh, with Vue.js or web development in general, mm -hmm. stuff like AI, virtual reality, mm -hmm. uh, maybe stuff like hybrid working, 5G. Mm -hmm. um, we did have one talk from Tim Bennix uh, mm -hmm. where he was combining, uh, using AI to automate some of his tasks and then used Vue to implement uh, the result of that. Have you considered, uh, or are you using uh, like some of these popular trends in your current workflow, or do you foresee uh, changes mm -hmm. happening in our world when it comes to these kinds of things? Well, personally, I think VR's uh, biggest use case is still sort of virtual events or gaming, uh, yeah. that which is a little bit far from what I do yeah. in the daily process. I think AI is interesting. The closest relation connection would probably be trying to use AI to answer our daily questions, looking for documentation. But for me personally, I try to use ChatGPT to do some simple tasks. But you know, the biggest problem is uh, because it's fundamentally still a statistic model, it doesn't guarantee the correctness of the outcome. Um, in a lot of ways, I still have to verify whether it's actually saying the right thing myself. And that's actually more work than it's necessary. And also, um, because it's being trained on some of the most common things you see on the internet, it really can't help you when you're working at a lower level. Like when I'm working on Vue itself, AI really can't help much because it's not the type of typical code you would see every day on the internet. Um, so I think, in a way, I still see AI as more as a uh, supportive technology. It won't be able to 
completely replaced your creativity as a programmer. Um, but but I, I agree, we are at sort of a singularity point where AI may be one day just be useful enough for you to be more productive, but I don't think it'll be able to replace us in any way. Um, maybe I'm optimistic, but... Uh, <laughs> We don't know, yeah. right? It's yeah, like, we don't know. who knows, someone comes up with some kind of weird invention and we will, we're all like, okay, we're gone now. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, me as a, no, I have no clue about the internals of the build tools and stuff like that, but I heard one fancy word that came from the gaming industry called predictive rendering, mm -hmm. and it seems to utilize like uh, machine learning or something ah, like that. Okay. And I was like, okay, if I tell this to FNU, maybe next year he has like some kind of working implementation. <laughs> so, do you have any uh, like? Do you have some gross ideas about like? Oh, maybe. So, I think there was an interesting project uh, previously. I think in the Angular ecosystem where some because when we are doing a large application, we need to code split, right? Right, right now, code split is still kind of a manual optimization. You need to decide where to code split, but. Uh, the optimal code splitting strategy kind of depends on how the user actually visits your site, right? So there was a project where it con collects statistics, analytics data from actual user visits, and then use that data to train a model to try to determine what is the optimal code splitting strategy. I think that's a very creative use of the use of technology. Um, but outside of that, I think I don't have very clear ideas out on how AI would integrate with front end. Um, so it's something still worth exploring, but honestly, I don't have very good ideas at this moment. We're open for a pull request, so. <laughs> yeah. If you have ideas on how AI could improve front end developer work, you know, open an RFC, we can see, you know, maybe there are some great ideas. We can invent the next wave of new front end frameworks. <laughs> it's gonna be few.ai, right? Um, <laughs> So, um, if you can give five tips for any developer, can be soft skill, hard skill related, mm. uh, what would those be? Five tips, okay. Yeah. Um, well, it can be four, but... Sure, uh, I think the first one is... Um, I guess the first one, especially for open source maintainers, is to... Uh, is to be mindful of your own, like, uh, your own goals with open source because uh, it's very easy to be obsessed with your project uh, and eventually leads to burnout. Uh, I think it's important to maintain a healthy mental state when you're working on open source. Uh, it's not easier said than done, but I think that's super important uh, for the sustainability for, for the other projects that we have. Um, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a pure, uh, net loss if you work too hard and eventually you lead to burnout and abandon your project. It's better to just take it easy, but keep working on it for the longer term. Um, I think the second thing is probably be willing to step out of your comfort zone, right? Uh, when you when you learn about a technology, be open-minded and try to look at other options, compare what's the differences, pros and cons, instead of be um, Instead of having, it's very common for us to see you become very attached to the technology that you work most with and think, okay, like if someone else is criticizes it, like you feel bad, but you don't have to because you, the technology doesn't own you. You own the technologies. And um, you have We're the able option. to change, right? Yeah, you, you have the option to learn more than one technology. So I think. Keeping an open mind is always helpful for you in the long term as well, because uh, you don't want to lock yourself into just one path. Uh, as, a, as a programmer, um, because the ecosystem moves really fast, you need to be able to adapt to change and be willing to accept new things. So yeah, I think these are probably two of the things that would come to mind. I don't. Is that well, well, yeah. well, yeah, they're, they're yeah. very good. Like, uh, okay. I can so relate to this. It's very easy to fall into the trap of, mm -hmm. um, 
choosing a tool, being highly invested in it, in it and then sort yeah. of sticking to the tool only to realize later on like, oh wait, there's a, like a boundary that I have to cross over mm -hmm. and it's so much easier to be uh, emotionally attached to that one tool, right? Yeah. So yeah, I think it's a very great tip that you could give to developers. Um, well, that, that concludes it. Uh, okay. Thank you very great. much. Uh, yeah. Thank you.